Les and Clayton and I got to experience him when he was in his 30s. He wasn't so kind and gentle back then. We had to get up and go to early morning seminary in the winter time. And that meant that we'd be getting up in the dark. You know, everybody hears about these boots coming across the floor. Well, we, we hurt those boots too. It was before daylight, we had to go milk the cows before we go into town. I can still remember Wes and I, we'd both get on one cow, four hands, just going like crazy. And that's the year I invented 2% milk. <laughs> if you don't get that, I'm not going to explain. You mentioned about these early morning sounds and the boots pounding through the kitchen. We got another report, another sound that just caught you like that, and that was usually the wood stove opening the door and sitting and getting up, getting the fire started in the morning again. That was always something that always kept you. I was away from school, and, and back when you were able to to carry on a good conversation with Dad, we were talking to him on the phone, and when he had some sheep, and he's having problems with dogs, so I'm, I'm with you. He went and slept out in the well house, took his shotgun or whatever he used. When those dogs came, you know, he killed a couple of dogs. Then he went and got his flashlight and looked, and they were his own dogs. See, this is why I don't like getting up. Then there's nothing to take a beat, and then I can get the ball baby there and look. You know, we worked together for 30 years. Not once in 30 years did we ever have a fight. Really, not even a disagreement. That's just the way it was. We just did not fight over stupid stuff. That don't happen very often. I guess it's because he was a dad, and well, he always did it his way. called dad would always ask him how you doing how's carol doing how's Wes doing you know what's trish and tonder doing and he'd always tell me Wes is working hard so what's Wes doing see i think he's probably out at the end of, on the end of a shovel right now <laughs> and anyway i've always admired that partnership they always got along well dad never had anything but good to say about Wes and what he did around here taking care of the farm and helping him out but i remember one one story when we were younger I think I'd just come off my mission. I think Wes was just married. We were up in Wagon Mountain. And he used to have a guy there by the name of Pula who took care of the ranch. And Pula had a horse that he thought was an outlaw. And he was telling Dad about how this horse was so, so rank that nobody could handle him. And Dad said, well, let Wes try him out. Dad and I and Pula are standing there. Wes gets on the horse. And the horse starts to kind of crow up a little bit. Wes immediately gets off, grabs the head stall, and commences to kick that horse about 10 times in the belly. And it looked like a little kid with his dad. The horse was going around. That horse was so spoiled, we never had anybody treat him like that. Pula's eyes were big. I think my eyes were big. The horse's eyes were really big. And then he got back on, and that horse is good the rest of the day. One thing I did want to say. I went and saw Dad in Gallup when he was in the hospital there about a week and a half ago. I was talking to him. Yeah, I asked him how Carol was doing. He said, I couldn't do it without her. He told me that she's helped me and I couldn't do it without her. All the different troubles I've had, she's always been here to help. And I just want to express our appreciation to you for all the help you've given him, especially in the last couple of years. We really, really do appreciate it.
right? Dad's never been that athletic, or we never thought it was that athletic. In fact, we're talking today, there were two times in particular that I remember Dad, Trace and I playing basketball on our dirt basketball court up across the road from the big house. And I don't know if it was a wild hair or what, but Dad picked up the basketball and shot it kind of awkwardly a couple times and then just walked away. Another time he had pop flies to us, I'll never forget those two times. But one time when they were doing a 24th July celebration here in Woodwall, it used to be a big party. And I don't remember how old I was, but I remember right next to the Wetton's home over here on this street, they had a barrel set up, and Uncle Burt Roundy was on a black horse, and Dad and him raced. And I don't remember exactly, I'm sure he gave him a head start, but Dad went around the barrel, and in my mind, he beat Uncle Burt. Now, he probably didn't. I can't see how that'd be physically possible. But I remember just being in total awe of my dad thinking, how fast my dad is. He just beat this horse. Uh, the thing that stands out in my mind, you know, in the, in the LDS culture, we have peculiarities when yeah. someone gets a mission call, it becomes a major event. I got my mission call, and uh, this is like 1979. I, been away to school for a year. I come home and I was actually working at Anaconda. Uh, my dad was still working there. I got a call from my mom saying, oh, your mission call came in today. It's like, great, maybe I'll come home for lunch and I'll, I'll open it. And when 10 minutes later, dad was, was there. He says, here, open this. So he stood there looking over me as I read it. No response or anything. He said, that's good. It was just he and I. <laughs> as I've listened to a lot of comments from the grandkids, Might be not quite as the same for the kids, particularly the older kids. Um, so I think maybe Dad was kind of refined as he got a little older, became a little softer. But I wonder, you know, if, if Dad could say something, to, particularly to his grandkids, what would he say? You know, I thought I, he didn't do anything particularly special in his life. His life was actually pretty simple and straightforward and pretty basic. But uh, you know, we've learned we've learned some great things I think from his life. You know, I, I just wonder what he would say to his grandkids. It reminds me of a story that a lot of people are familiar with. But perhaps a question he'd ask would be, you know, what what are you doing with my name? And what are you gonna do with his name? You know, Shaylee mentioned how proud she was when the teacher mentioned the, the, the Wingerts and how she was proud to do that and be a part of that. There's a lot of life experiences yet to come and you know, that would be the challenge I'd I believe, particularly with the grandkids, you know, what, what are you going to do with Grandpa's name? Are you going to make it good? Are you going to make it better? Or are you going to keep his le legacy alive? <laughs> Wes and Betts and I were coming back from uh, Provo. They were still dating. They were coming across the reservation, and we broke down in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that. And back then, there's no cell phones, nothing like that, but there happened to be a trading post not too far away. I guess Wes and Bess wanted some alone time, I don't know. But I was elected to go call. Dad answers the phone and says, Dylan Winger's on the line, yes, will you accept the charges? He said no and hung up. I walked back over where Wes and Bess were and I said, he wouldn't take the call. We're out in the middle of nowhere, middle of the night, car doesn't run. I said, well, go try it again. <laughs> so I went over and I called him that time. He did answer. He did accept the charges. Wesley and Morris were always just the true American cowboys for me. You know, I always looked up to both of them. And uh, this was just when Betsy had died and there was a bunch of hay in the fields and we had to go get the hay in. And so a bunch of us came out to help. And Trishelle and I were dating and I don't know if we were engaged yet or not. Or we were, it was close, but uh, anyway. I wanted to impress Morris and Wes, and so I was busting, you know, and I think some of the people around me were just doing a lot of talking, and I was trying to throw it in. Really, like Laura, you know, I just wanted to impress Morris really bad and Wes, and so Richard Jones was there, and he said, Gordon, slow down a little bit. I think he's already impressed with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then one time when we were in vet school, Trishelle was working as a nurse, and she had made some comment. I don't know. I can't remember the comment, but later Morris pulled she her aside. Like, I pay the bills or something. Trishelle said, so I, I'm, I'm the breadwinner. I, I pay the bills. And he pulled her aside later and was so worried about how that would make me feel, you know, and, and just told her not to do that. I don't remember what he told her. 
that always impressed me. You know, he worried about how that would make me feel. Um, we borrowed fifty thousand dollars from Grandpa. A lot of money to buy the clinic and to get started. You know, without him, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Fifty thousand dollars. So we set it up to pay him back with interest. And we made double payments most of the time. And we just paid him off, or I think we owe him three hundred dollars. I don't know. We just paid it off, and he came to me and just really praised us. Said, "I'm so proud of you guys. You, you know, you borrowed that money and you paid it off early, and thank you for doing that." And you, you just tried to make me feel good that we were able to pay him back and, and to do that. So that that impressed me. Uh, and then well, a couple days before he died, I think I just knew you know, things were just, it was just going downhill, going downhill. But, so I knew, you know, I had the feeling he, he may not make it. I don't, I don't think he's going to make it. But I just, uh, I was driving from the cabin back to Wesley's, and uh, I don't know what I was doing, I was hauling something. And I was watching Wes out in the field. There's kind of two families here. There's there's kind of the older family, Wes and I, and I guess maybe Tammy might fall in there, or Clayton, and then all the other ones, all the younger kids. But up in Pagosa, you know, he was 30 years old, 35 right in there, and he had this huge responsibility of taking care of this permit. He needed our help. He couldn't have done it by himself. And he used to work us from sun up to sundown, riding. We would ride 25, 30 miles a day. I don't know how many miles. I can remember being so tired at night, I'd come home and I'd have hallucinations. But I was still riding. I'd have to look at a window and say, okay, that's a window. I'm not out riding. I'm here in bed. And that's how hard he would work us. But he said many times, without us, without us three boys, he couldn't have done it by himself because it was just too much work. And we were up there last week, went to the old ranch, and was able to tell some stories. We actually went to the ranch house. The guy that owns the ranch, he come down on his four-wheeler, Want to know what we were doing. We told him we'd lived there many years ago. So he let us go in the house. We went to the barn. As soon as we went out to the barn, I had a memory come to, come to mind. When we first got there, it was Dad shooting a horse. And I think that's where I first learned to cuss. It is a difficult horse, and I remember he was having a hard time, and he was upset with that horse. But he said some words I'd never heard, and I still remember that experience of watching him shoot that horse. He finally had to tie up one leg and throw him down to shoe him. Christmas Day, when we were in Pullman, Washington, you were in school, and Grandma and Grandpa came to spend Christmas with us. And I had a really bad ear infection. I was in the hospital with an ear infection, so dumb. But they let me come home for Christmas, but I had to come back Christmas morning to have IV um, antibiotics. And Grandpa volunteered to come with me, but we had to go at five in the morning. We got up and went there, and Christmas morning we sat together, and the hospital was dead quiet, and there was Christmas music playing, and he just sat and held my hand for four hours while I had IV. Aww. Another story that Janelle and I remember is when we first got married, obviously newlyweds going to work, going to school. Janelle had jumped on my back for some reason and I was walking around. But anyway, a little, a little time later he said, let me get this straight. He said, you're, you work full time, you go to school full time, you're married full time, and you're broke to ride. <laughs> session. Our family went through phases of racquetball and this time we're going through golf. 
And it was Thanksgiving morning in Concho, but we're slicing the ball and we're squibbing the ball and we're pulling the ball and it just looked ugly. And dad's there dressed up and he says, well, how hard can it be? And he grabs one of our clubs, gets up there and about like this, we're kidding, he takes three whacks. Whack, whack, whack! <laughs> and squibbed it about 10 feet, dropped the club, and walked away. Being on the back of a dirt bike, headed up to the lake. When dad would have to go up to the lake to turn on more water. And I'm holding on for all I'm worth. Getting up to the lake. And dad would go down the side of the canyon so damn fast. Just kept thinking, I'm going to trip and fall down this canyon. One time he and Logan and I went to Tulsa to look at a head wagon. And Logan was about 12 years old at the time. And he would not shut up. And dad, you didn't stop at like McDonald's on the way. or I mean, he had to find like a little cafe in a little town. And he was very picky where he'd stop. It's been such a blessing. <coughs> since we moved back. I have not done green chili by myself, not one time. And generally, I give the money to dad because he has to go buy the green chili for me and stand there and watch them roast it because he makes make sure that they roast it perfectly so it's easy to peel. Then he comes and helps me peel it. And I have to wear gloves or else I'm whining for two days that my hands are burning, but his hands never burn. Billy Green passed away, so he and I drove to Kamado. Of course, at the funeral, he couldn't hear much of what was said. So on the way home, I told him all the stories, had a good laugh together. When Skylar got his endowments and we went through the temple, and we were able to do Grandma Lingert's temple work. I'll never forget how he looked whenever he was giving a blessing to Michaela in behalf of his mother. You didn't see him show a lot of emotion and cry much, but his shoulders just slumped and he just had big tears in his eyes as he was confirming Michaela. And he was sealed to his parents and Zachary stood in for Grandpa and Ashley stood in for Grandma to be there with him and, and to spend that time with him. I'm so grateful that we grew up in St. John's, where we got to spend a lot of our summers over here. So lots and lots of time. My memories of Grandpa were guns. I've always loved guns. I think I got it from him, to be honest. My poor wife, he would grab my hand and take me in his room and set me on his bed, open up the safe and show me whatever new gun he got. Sometimes I saw that gun three times before. He just didn't remember, I guess. <laughs> But, you know, I loved that. And we sit there and talk about that and whatever other cool guns we, we knew of. And that was just such a cool thing for me. Somehow, every time I came over, we ended up in his truck out in the field shooting prairie dogs. This last time, we, it was about a month ago, I came over. We laid waste to those things that day. I've never shot so many in my life. I think we 40 to 50. And it was all morning. It was fantastic. But he couldn't see it. He couldn't see the prairie dogs. And so I was in the passenger seat and Hiram is in the back yelling, kill it, dad, kill it, dad. And, and every time I shot, Grandpa would always, hey, did you get it, did you get it? And if I said yes, he'd just giggle. As soon as I ran out of bullets, he'd take my clip and reload it up and give it back as fast as we could. In fact, he had two, so I was never empty. So glad that I came over that day, because it's one of those moments I'll, I'll never forget now. You know, you never know at the time that, uh, you know, the end was near. At Callie's wedding, we took Grandpa back to Tammy's house to get his is dialysis stuff. I don't know when I said I would take him that it was gonna be two hours, you know, I didn't know it was that far to drive, but again, I'm so glad that we went because I had no idea where I was going and it was dark. I had my GPS going to get me there and Grandpa kept telling me to go opposite of what my GPS was saying. So the whole time I'm just like, uh, I don't know, but you can't tell Grandpa no, so you do it. <laughs> and every time he told me to go somewhere, so my phone was telling me to do the opposite. After a while, he's like, oh, you passed it. And well, there was Tammy's house right there next to us. I remember when I was, a, uh, I, I must have been really young. Grandma had some blue truck, but he had his window rolled down and he hocked the loogie out the window. And no, I just, I didn't really know what I was doing. So I rolled down the window. I thought I'm trying to really realize what I was doing. And I tried hocking the loogie out my window, but it landed on my chin. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And finally he kind of pulled over and showed me how to hock a loogie. <laughs> Grandpa showed me how to hock a loogie. And just like, uh, uh, Jeanette said about those boots going across the kitchen floor. She would go and stay there for a long time. Luckily, I raised a lot of hell in high school because I was in blue water a lot as punishment. I mean, heck, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> and little did Dad know that we couldn't wait to get out of the house when he was mad at us. So we're like, yeah, send me to blue water, please. And Grandma would. She said, what do you want to eat the whole week? You know, let me know. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I would, you know, write out whatever I wanted. And bam, 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 bam. Every time, there was exactly what I wanted. Grandma would keep you up until two o'clock in the morning, talking your ear off. And then Grandpa would wake up an hour, an hour later to go change water or something. You'd hear those boots coming across the floor and you remember just pulling the covers on my head just saying, no, this is not real. This is not real, this is not real. And sure enough, press, go on, let's go. 
That was your punishment. <laughs> that was the punishment, yeah, sure. But of course, I, I got up to breakfast already made, so that was cool. Growing up, I don't know that a, a little boy could could uh, ever ask for better grandparents than we had. You know, Grandma could love you like no one else could, and then Grandpa would turn around and work you like no one else could. So he had the best of both worlds the whole time, you know. And uh, you know, cousins camp. You know, anyone that was old enough to do that, how could you not just cherish those memories? Not showering for a week. Where's Devin? We both smelled, we both smelled so bad, and I don't think I didn't change my shorts once. I think my mom made me throw away these gold shorts I had when I got home because I literally didn't take them off. The water was such a huge part of my childhood. The amount of time we got to spend over here, it, you know, we really lucked out. Obviously, a lot of our grandparents, but even being able to hang out with Wes. You know, a lot of the memories here have to do with him as well, up on the mountain and riding horses with him. And, and I'm so glad I had the opportunity to spend some of his last moments with him there at the hospital. He wasn't obviously able to, to talk to you, but I'm just so grateful that that was something that myself and obviously others got to do as well, because that was, that was really special for me, being able to say goodbye, because, uh, you know, he taught me so much. Even though he didn't know he was teaching me anything, he, he definitely was. Just as a young boy, you know, you watch, and then when you watch, you learn. So. I did like got to come to my wedding. I think it was a dollar year. I don't remember, but I think it was grandpa. And I was just trying to talk to him, saying, like, thank you for coming, and what, what? Okay, I'm just going to enjoy this moment. So we just kept dancing, and I think at the same time, we started to think about grandma, and, and he just squeezed my hand tighter, and pulled me closer, and said, I love you, and grandma loves you. And it's just a tender moment that I'm never going to forget. We went to go to the hospital. After me and Sky had flown in, Kayla and Emma Jo and we let everyone grab his hand. And so like everyone said, that he would always grab your hand and squeeze it. And so I went to grab it. I couldn't do it because I wanted to touch his hand and have him squeeze my hand. But I knew that it wasn't going to happen. I love his callous hands. And him and Sky used to joke that's what a real man's hands felt like. It's just like a pollen hay on the tongue or, or irrigating or and gathering wood or chopping it, just a lot of really, really long days and just being starving and then getting nothing back at the trailer but saltine crackers and pot of meat. So. Grandma used to like to tease him a bit and like nickname some of the stuff. That, was there ever like a yellow car we called the banana boat? I remember that car. Like. Yeah. And then we had the Lincoln horse, or something. Horse. And I think he was kind of upset one night, but he had to go irrigate. And so he, I was just a kid. It was way before the we had the cabin out there, and just south, just south of the Quonset barn, he'd have the trailer. And so he, put, he took me out there, and I was just a kid going on. Hey, we're gonna we're going out to the the boar's nest, and he was quiet. Are we gonna take the banana boat? And he finally said, "That's the Cadillac. We're going to the trailer." He's kind of, <laughs> he kind of quiet the rest of the night. But uh, just driving with him a lot. He's I've never seen anybody be able to nap so quickly as him. Like, he was so good at. Just taking a quick nap and then being completely recharged. I never could as a kid. I'd just be sitting there quiet waiting for him. One time we did stop and he took his little nap and then he got out and he went off. And then that's, I was just waiting for him. I thought he was going to go take a pit stop. You know, does anybody else remember that about Grandpa? His, his certain stance? <laughs> okay, it's always just like that. It's Grandpa's stance, right? Always, since yeah. forever. But I thought he was off to do that. Then I heard him calling for me. Of course, I was a kid, I don't remember how old I was, but it was early, early summer, so there's still a lot of wildflowers out there. And so he, he told me, get over here and start picking some of these. So we were, I was out there picking flowers in the mountains with Grandpa, and we had a big bouquet, and we took them on the ground. Uh, one thing I got to share with him, I, when I lived here in Albuquerque, he was doing a lot of genealogy work. I'd been in Taos for a day, and I found a line of our family from Grandma Cora that goes back into like a St. Brain, it was, and he's kind of a big deal around there, and I kind of told him about this, and he kind of got really excited about that, and he, for a while after that, whenever he'd go to places up there in northern New Mexico, he'd call me up and be like, hey, we went to this place where this guy was born, and he's kind of really excited about a lot of that historical stuff about the family, and real proud of our heritage. And Grandpa would always say, oh, Lori, I'm so sorry, I forgot to get you some corn chips. <laughs> that's all I ate with corn chips. <laughs> and I'm like, Grandpa ate more than corn chips. I'm not sure if Grandpa really didn't understand that Rhett's name was Rhett, but he always called it Brett. He's like, no, Grandpa, his name's Rhett. Okay, Brett, come here. So now we're not sure if he really can that's his name. <laughs> Morris made me always feel so special being a daughter-in-law and part of the family. He's always willing just to jump in and help whenever we were cooking or whatever was going on. I mean, just sometimes you see him by him and you just didn't even have his name. He just felt special and loved by him. I had a want to prove myself to Morris moment. We went out to feed and he had 
bales of hay stacked on their sides in the back of the truck. He said, Justin, I'll drive. You beat. Went to grab a bale to roll it to, to, to myself so I could cut it and, and sling it. I didn't have gloves on. And an alfalfa stem shot straight up my nail and it broke off underneath the nail. Of course, I'm like, <laughs> you have to cry in front of Grandpa. <laughs> Grandpa's still driving, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm an easy painter. So I'm like, <laughs> it's cold, it's so cold, you know. But I keep, if he's driving, I'm, I keep feeding. I kind of make easy. He told me, he said, make sure you get it real even, real even. <clears throat> a lot of snow. I never had the guts to tell him. I'd get back to the house about 30 minutes later, but this time I could feel my heart beat, my finger, my jaw like, twitching. And I showed Janelina, she's like, ah! <laughs> looks at it, and he grabs for his knife. He whips it out, he says, here, here, here. And I said, no, 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 no. He said, well, we can pick it out. I said, I don't think so, more. So we went to the emergency room, and the doctor, he comes in. So I can numb that. That's gonna hurt. Or I can just pull it out with some tweezers, and Morris says, I'll hold his hand. <laughs> Morris will take my arm down while that doctor stuck tweezers up my fingernail, grab that stock of alfalfa. Oh, I didn't go into the alfalfa, but then he almost had like one tear, you know. He would never waste anything. 
And Seth's not here, he'd back me up. Grandpa would always make this thing called blue cornmeal. For some reason, Grandma wasn't cooking, on a rarity. He stood not two feet away from me and Seth and stared at us like this until we drank all of that blue cornmeal. <laughs> I remember being the hottest, sickest, nastiest thing I ever tasted in my entire life. <laughs> and he would not let us leave until we left. Growing up in St. John's, I got to come over to Blue Water and spend a lot of time during the summers. And Grandpa taught a lot of things. He uh, taught me how to change a tire, sweep a floor properly, because obviously I wasn't good at that. In high school, I played a lot of sports, and so I didn't, in summer I didn't have a, a lot of time to get you know, some normal job. So one of the things I, I did was I, I rode Colts, and Grandpa, he, had, he was nasty, and he, and he wanted me to ride her one summer. When I was sitting there talking to Grandpa, figuring out what, what we do as far as payment, he shouts out the idea that said I should pay him for the experience that I would gain. <laughs> Lucky enough, we, we, we figured something out. <laughs> outside of Cousin's Camp. And I remember it was Easton and I, and Grandpa took us to go change the water with him. And so he's off driving down the dirt roads, and we're in the bed of the truck kind of sitting on the edge there. And we go and we hit a bump. And Easton flies up, the truck keeps moving, and he just falls straight to the ground. Grandpa jumps out and looks at him, he's like, well, what are you doing down there? So he picks him up, puts him back on the truck, and he's like, now don't you tell your mom, okay? If you don't, we'll get you another dilly bar. And he did. After we finished that, we took it back to Dairy Queen and got a second one. There's a couple with Grandpa that stick out the most to me, and one of them was sophomore year of high school. We went to the NFR there in Las Vegas, where my parents were in New York, and so they were going to meet us there. So I drove up to Holbrook, met Grandpa, and just like Kylie, I drove the whole way with the radio off while Grandpa slept. When we got there, we had some time to wait, so he's like, well, Grandpa, what do you want to do? He's like, well, do you want to go on the walk? I was like, well, sure, we're in Vegas, I guess. <laughs> so there we are, me and Grandpa walking down, you know, the strip, and you know, trying to avoid all the people giving us cars. You asked me the other night how I met Teresa, you know. We had gone to the state of Albuquerque, and they had a dance afterwards, a really good dance. And there was this girl, there were three or four girls from the ranch. And I had a brown corduroy jacket, and so did Rita. So I asked her to dance. Afterwards, you was walking back to the sidelines. She held my hand. And uh, that changed my life. We got married the following year. We started our family. We worked on the ranch for a while up there at Fort Sumner. And when we come back and I went to work for the mines there at Grants. And I think we had Wesley Clayton and Delman when we went to the temple. But first, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I took the lessons I had a guy there. He was a forest ranger. He was a belt. Um, and he was a missionary. And he gave us a lesson about Moses how you were around me. Anyway, I got baptized there at the Blue Water in the old church here. And Grandpa Randy baptized me. And I come out of the water, and I don't know if it was Wesley or Delwin or one of them guys. said, Dad, you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, about a year later, we went to the country of Mesa. Let's see it. I kept working for the mines. Uh, later on, I quit and I went to work for Rita's brother. Both worked there for about two or three years and back again. I worked there till they closed the mines down. And all the time, you know, I, I had some cattle up there wagging down and I drove up there. Yep. <coughs> yep, my dad. And that was a high life for all of us. We'd go up there. We, I had a schedule where I was off four days, and just about every time we got four days off, we'd load up and go down there. And my folks really enjoyed this.
You heard the, the other night that they wanted to adopt Terry. But, you know, they wouldn't work. But anyway, we stayed close to it. My dad, you know, was, we was raised poor, but we had two rooms. We lived in two rooms. We had a kitchen in the bedroom. In the room. But my mother made a thing out. She was clean. I never complained. We never laughed for anything. We didn't have nothing. Nothing. Most kids take for granted now. You know. My Christmas present, I remember. I had an aunt that would give me a little basketball. That was hard. That was about 